Welcome everyone to this Teleflex uh, symposium, part of the Connect CTO uh, meeting this year. I wish I could say we were all in New York and enjoying one another's company, as it is usually the case uh, at this time of the year. Miss that very much. Um, and of course, we all hope to be back in New York next year. But I'm delighted uh, in lieu of a, a trip to New York uh, to host this virtual session on behalf of Teleflex. My name is Chris Buller and I'm the medical director for Teleflex Interventional. Uh, what we've pulled together for you uh, today is I think a, an interesting and conversational interaction uh, amongst uh, two guest experts who I'll introduce momentarily. Uh, our engineering team uh, in research and development engineering in particular and, uh, and myself. And uh, so we've titled this uh, Guide Extensions and Microcatheters from Novel to Necessary, which I think uh, betrays the theme we're going to be uh, carrying throughout. Uh, and indeed, we subtitled it a conversation amongst clinicians and engineers. And it's a delight to introduce the faculty uh, David Kanzari, uh, Dr. David Kanzari, uh, Dave, wave to the audience. Uh, David is the uh, Chief of uh, Heart and Cardiovascular Services at Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta and also Chief Scientific uh, Officer at the Institute. Uh, David has recently uh, been the uh, co-principal investigator for the Teleflex CTO trial and that may come up during our discussion. Uh, and with uh, David is Manos Barlakis, known to, I'm sure, many, many of you. Uh, Manos is the director uh, of the Center for Complex Coronary Intervention at the Minneapolis Heart Institute, just down the road from Teleflex. Uh, and of course, is uh, the author of the Manual of CTO Interventions, a very popular uh, uh, reference uh, book for us all. And the first author of, of perhaps the most cited uh, manuscript in the in the field of complex PCI, which is the hybrid algorithm manuscript that uh, he and others published back in 2012. And coincidentally, uh, Manus was also a lead enroller in the Teleflex CTO trial. So I'm betraying uh, their their academic uh, excellence uh, and their and their leadership in the field. But really what brings them on the on the uh, session today is that they're both superb operators. Uh, with deep experience going back decades uh, in complex PCI. And they've seen the development of, of tools over those decades and have a particular perspective, I think, to offer us on how to use guide extensions and microcatheters uh, optimally in our complex procedures. So welcome both of you. And I'm gonna start uh, the conversation by just uh, talking a little bit uh, about how we tend to think of the PCI history, the history of PCI in eras that relate to the, the therapies we deliver, the balloon era, uh, the uh, innovative device era around atherectomy and laser, the stent era, initially bare metal, the drug eluding stent era, and more recently uh, people have tried to coin the, the, uh, the bioresorbable stent era. But parallel to all of that development have been incredibly important uh, technical and technique developments uh, with tools that really enable the delivery of those therapies or optimize uh, the delivery and deployment of those therapies. And, and sometimes those uh, uh, bridesmaids technologies don't get the attention that they deserve. Uh, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if uh, it's fair to say that microcatheters and guide extensions fit into that uh, category of, of enabling uh, devices. David? Yeah, Chris, thanks for uh, having me as part of this program, too, and to be with you and Manus, uh, even but, uh, but by afar. I, I, as, I'm, as I'm listening to you share the, or introduce the experience with CTOs, it reminds me of roughly 20 years ago that I, I ran up to you in the faculty lounge at the TCT meeting and had proposed a CTO trial that we did together, the Across Tosca, uh, Tosca 4 clinical trial, and how different we performed CTO revascularization at that time. And even prior to that, working as a fellow uh, with nascent technologies like the Lumen front runner catheter and, 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 and to see the evolution of guide wire technology, of guide catheter support technology, specifically with different types of guide catheter extensions that we use now, and I'll come to that in a moment, and microcatheters that 
Yes, unequivocally, these are enabling technologies. We, we, uh, we have reached a level in CTO revascularization where among very experienced centers, we're observing approximately a 90% success rate in all comer CTO procedures. And while some might see it as plateauing, I think that uh, really this is the opportunity where we start to refine the practice further and where the incremental advancements in success and safety become much more challenging for us. It's not that they're out of reach, but that they're harder than large quantum leaps. You know, the analogy would be uh, moving from a combustion engine to the hybrid engine and then finer refinements upon the car, the Formula One car after that, you know, just shaving off those minor seconds um, become become ever so important, but more difficult to achieve. And that's kind of where we are in the in the space of CTO revascularization. My my only other comment about this is that when I I, I came across a quote uh, in a TCTMD article from about ten years ago, and it was about mother and child catheters. And I said, well, you know, we have these guide catheter extensions, but we don't really use them that much, except in complex procedures. And now I think about how commonplace and fundamental they are as part of the armamentarium as being an enabler um, technology. And I know we'll discuss that further. Thanks, Dave. Manas, uh, without getting uh, giving anything away, you, you definitely practiced uh, interventional cardiology before we had what we would consider to be a, a modern microcatheter or a modern guide extension. Uh, do, do you, can you even remember that era? What are your, what are your no, thoughts? You say that, and again, thanks, Chris, as well. Thanks for having us on. That's a wonderful uh, discussion going on. But I do remember when I was training, and that's back in 2000, that actually we were using the transit. Yes. And that was very rare, and it was for complex cases. And I remember how you know it was very bulky, hard to advance, but still it made things work. And even with equipment that is not quite anywhere near what we have today, you can still get wiring done in very complex lesions that didn't seem possible at the time. And then uh, it's interesting about other equipment. We actually were using the Proxys quite a bit, which was a embolic protection device for vein grafts that had a, a, a balloon around it and deep seated in the vessel. And essentially that was the same concept as now the a guide liner. So in a way we're using something else, but exactly the concept that you just mentioned now uh, and the guide liner and the guide extensions. Right. Yeah, it was, um, it it was the transit catheter or an over-the-wire balloon. Those were our primary support catheters for guide wires, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember writing an editorial about uh, probably 22, 23 years ago, uh, uh, commenting on uh, the improvements in technologies we had for delivering stents uh, back then, which preceded modern microcatheters and preceded modern guide extensions. And I, uh, but we had the sorts of uh, early nascent technologies like you've just uh, alluded to and and the the thesis of the editorial was that it was you know that angioplasty wasn't going to get easier we were just going to do harder patients and it was analogous to getting better at skiing and you ski more and more difficult runs you still fall uh but you're falling on a black diamond instead of on a blue run and uh, uh and that's really been the history over the last 20 years is the the tools and the techniques that go with them because we've had to learn how to use some of these tools and some of the tools when they were brought out of course we didn't know how to use it all initially and, and, and it's really been a process of discovery of how to use the tools optimally um, to, to have current technique. So let's let's turn now to microcatheters specifically. Uh, I don't know uh, what your first memories are of microcatheters. I do recall uh, using microcatheters and before them over the wire balloons in, for that function for very simple tasks like guide wire exchange and so on. How, how else did we use microcatheters, uh, say in the late 90s, early early uh, millennium, Dave? I think um, just as you described, Chris, in, and it was the over the wire balloon as we referenced, it was the transit catheter and we were using it mostly for guide wire exchange or um, in very challenging cases where we needed exchange for a guide wire and we didn't want to lose the real estate we'd already gained, but maybe go to a hydrophilic wire to advance even further, um, certainly for chronic total occlusion procedures. And then the other was um, either for a distal injection to confirm luminal placement or in some instances for drug delivery. Yeah, I remember the the uh, intracordial lytic era, of course, that, that, yeah. was, that was part of all that. That's going back another decade earlier. Um, Manus, uh, a really 
key milestone in our understanding of the contemporary use of microcatheters, I think was uh, the coining of the phrase base of operations, which I think in print was first seen in your hybrid article in 2012. Not sure if it was your language or the language of Craig Thompson or, or, or maybe a joint language, uh, but it, it really implies uh, a different way of using microcatheters, a much more complex and nuanced role for microcatheters in complex uh, PCI. Can you, can you expand on that? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And uh, you're right. Actually, it was Bill Lombardi, Aaron Grantham, Craig Thompson. You know, many people actually made that con uh, conception. I was more of the right, but they were the brains behind it, which is that, you know, you have to have something to help you get to where you want to go. And um, I must say, the base of operations, many people never learn, but I think the concept of it is now much more prevalent. People understand it much, much better. But I remember in the first editions of the book, for example, how all these discussions should be a microcatheter, should be an over the wire balloon, and why one has advantages or not. And I think these conversations are now practically over because everyone has realized that uh, using a microcatheter, the current generation at least, is uh, superbly, it's much more superior to using over the wire balloon. So these discussions no longer happen. But at the time, uh, the concept was how can you concentrate your force? How can you improve your manipulation power of the wire, the precision of manipulation, along with what just Dave said to exchange wires and um, do exchanges as well. So it's been the microcaster, I think, wasn't as prevalent early on, but I think now pretty much everyone agrees. And we do have this uh, global consensus that one of the seven key concepts of doing CTO PCI is that you were part of it and Dave was part of it as well, is that using a microcatheter is kind of the standard, the global standard around the world. And is it just for CTOs or is it is there a broader application in complex work? I think this has translated now when it comes to tortuosity, bifurcations. Now this has taken off and is used, as you said, in pretty much every complex lesion. It's not infrequent to have difficulty getting into the side branch after we jail a side branch and using a microcatheter can really help, or the balloon doesn't penetrate, and using a microcatheter there can help as well. Uh, tortuosity is critical. Uh, the angulated microcatheters are extremely useful for going through those bands, along with the hairpin wire technique sometimes. But uh, it, as you said, it's not just, I think once you use it once and you understand the basic concept about how to manipulate it, then uh, uh, you can apply it in many more scenarios of the whole spectrum of complex issues. Yeah, I, I, I to, um, yeah. Ahead, David. Sorry, just expand on Manus's comments too, which I completely support. Is that you know when you move the base of operations to the CTO site, for example, the proximal cap, uh, it's like bringing all your equipment uh, to build the house right at the property itself. And specifically, the, the the equipment changes in a way too that you now are taking a wire that might have had very different properties with regard to pushability, torqueability. Um, from a distant site, uh, from the from the guide catheter origin, now to the site with the microcatheter that now maybe has greater penetrating force, greater torqueability, greater manipulability as well, and um, and just to expand on the on Manus's comments about tortuosity. I'm just referencing a case from today, for instance, that in even very calcific disease that we have a case where we can cross with a guide wire. There's a clear need to change out for atherectomy technologies. We need to do an exchange and you know we leverage the properties of matching um, as we'll soon discuss the the design of the microcatheter to the specific function is it deliverability that's needed is it pushability that's needed is it penetration that's needed and you can specialize that microcatheter technology to its to its suited purpose for in this instance uh, uh, exchange for guide wire and very calcific disease Let's get back to that in a second, but I just before we before we move and perhaps bring the engineers in on some of those points that you've specifically raised. One of the things that I wonder about is the degree to which the rank and file interventional cardiologist has fully appreciated, endorsed and adopted the role of microcatheters in in difficult cases. It, 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 do we have room to go there or do you think it's prime time now? Um, maybe at least speaking for myself, I think certainly we have room to maneuver um, and there's room for improvement. Um, we still see uh, a number of attempted CTOs throughout our region of the United States um, that are attempted with um, 
early nascent develop design cath tran uh, catheters for support and or over the wire balloons. I think that um, on a later discussion, guide catheter extension is probably more commonplace and, and has a greater level of awareness for most interventionalists, but the micro catheters and the nuances between them, I think um, is still an opportunity for education. But Manus, your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree with you, Dave, that uh, the adoption is limited. I think we're kind of biased because we're more into the CTO world where it's a standard equipment. Everyone uses a routine thing, don't think about it. But for people who don't routinely do CTOs, I think it's used much less commonly. And part of the challenge there is once you don't use it routinely, then once you need it for a very complex case, you have the issue. It's like a coil that you don't know how to use it. So now you have to do an exchange, but you never done trapping before. Yeah. So now you have to learn it when you're pressure for time, the patient is potentially unstable. So this is why using it more routinely helps people go through this early learning curve and adopt this in a more wide uh, application. It's probably a great time to introduce uh, the engineers who've, who've joined us for the call, two, uh, two wonderful guys who I have the privilege of working with uh, almost every day, uh, Josh uh, Bernizer and Alex Marine, and and I'm just going to affectionately uh, say that uh, Josh uh, is, uh, uh, you know, in in my house, uh, the the godfather of the guideliner uh, back from the very early days. He'll be the first to tell you he wasn't the only one who worked on it, but my gosh, his role was absolutely central to the development of that tool. And Alex, your middle name is uh, Turnpike uh, for a good reason. Um, a huge part of the uh, uh, complex engineering that's gone into that family of, of catheters. So uh, a few minutes ago, uh, Dave uh, Kanzari mentioned the issue of changing wire uh, characteristics or performance, uh, coupling a wire with a microcatheter. Is there, is there physics behind that? Or, or is that just, is that just, uh, you know, sleight of hand and, 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 and fancy, fanciful thought? Yeah, th thanks, Chris. Um, no, there there is absolutely physics behind that, and it's uh, it's something that we've um, put some effort into um, in, in in some um, recent investigation to uh, to put some some quantitative data around um, how that how that microcatheter and wire interaction works. And uh, as as you would kind of envision, as you as you sort of choke up on a wire, um, the same way that you you know you choke up on on uh, on a wire that you were attempting to push into the hub, if you were encountering resistance in an attempt to not get that to buckle, um, as you move the microcatheter tip towards the tip of the wire and sort of close that distance, um, you're you're effectively increasing, um, you, you know, your, uh, your the the effective wire stiffness. Um, that you have available to you there at the end. So, um, using I guess the the combination of those two, um, the microcatheter and and the wire um, as a combined tool can really kind of supercharge the effectiveness of uh, of the wire um, as long as you you know you you pay attention to the support that you're adding with the the microcatheter tip. And Manus, is this just theory, or does this actually work in practice in your experience? No, I I completely agree with Alex. It's uh, actually there's a graph. Um, I think it was uh, from Osamu Kato. It was uh, an early graph showing that how the stiffness increases with how close you get to the uh, tip of the microcatheter. And, you know, initially for me, as you say, it was kind of, okay, whatever. I mean, yeah, I'm sure. But then uh, uh, once you actually use it, you understand the mechanism, which is you're not allowed to bend, right? When you get closer to the tip, then the wire doesn't have room to bend. So the force you apply on the back end gets transmitted much more so to the front end, increasing the penetrating power. And once that clicked on me, then then it does make sense why putting the wire very close to the with microcatheter that really supercharges the wire and makes it much more penetrating. So I think there is obviously some more uh, in intricate uh, equations and everything, but the basic concept that microcatheter really makes the wire more penetrating, I think that's uh, that's a reality. You realize it every day you do a CTO or any other complex procedure. And also it's a good thing, but it can be a bad thing as well. If you push a stiff wire through microcatheter very in a place you shouldn't, then bad things can happen as well. Yeah, there's no soft wire as it initially emerges at the tip of a, of a microcatheter, is there? Every, every wire is stiff at that point. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, great. Uh, sticking with you for a second, Manus, uh, in that same hybrid paper, uh, you did call out the importance of, of, uh, of a device uh, manufactured by SI, the Corsair catheter, which really was a breakthrough device. I think we have to acknowledge that all of us, uh, uh, those of us in industry and those not. 
uh, the first really torqueable and highly slippery microcatheter that was useful for collateral crossing, which was, you know, revolutionary. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, this is this is out beyond the edge of my envelope. Um, that catheter, in addition to being a breakthrough product in its own right, has also, of course, spurned the development of many uh, next generation competitive devices among several manufacturers, not just Teleflex, not just Asahi. Uh, how should we start to think now? How, how do we categorize this, this wide range of microcatheters that are now offered to us? How do we get our head around it so that we can select them rationally? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And I think that's something that uh, can become an issue because as you say, there are many options now. So if you want to get everything, your catalog manager is going to get very upset and probably you won't get it anyway. <laughs> And there are so many options. And in my mind, I like to group them based on function into five categories. The one category is um, the kind of larger torqueable microcatheters. The second category are the smaller, lower profile, which can be torqueable or not, but they're lower profile, for example, for crossing small collaterals. The third category are the dual lumens, which can be used both for undergrade, parallel wiring, but also can be used for saving bifurcation, sometimes even going retrograde. And then the fourth one is the angulated ones, um, the ones that help you get into the side branches or go retrograde through the distal touchdown of a saphenous vein graft or any sort of tortuosity, or if you jail a side branch. And the fifth category, I like to call them the plaque modification ones, which are the ones that you use once the wire goes through and then nothing else will go. The ones that have kind of a screw at the tip, and then you can potentially effectively modify the plaque as you advance it through this uh, um, balloon and crossable lesion. So five categories, large, small, angulated, dual lumen, and plaque modification one. That's again, just the functional classification that I find useful uh, for my thinking. And David, is that is that how you think about them or roughly? I do. I, I agree with Manis. And it's something that I referenced earlier of uh, the form fitting the function here is that this is not a class effect, so to speak. That would be an oversimplification of microcatheters. But We've now evolved with microcatheter technology, and we can discuss whether there's even room for further advancement, but we've we've entered an era where we have very specialized microcatheters. The analogy for me is a, a set of golf clubs. You don't go out with one club, right? Um, you have multiple different clubs, and it's the same for microcatheters, having very different specialized utilities. And how how would you suggest, so for the non-CTO operator who, who needs to, to um, uh, get familiar with uh, a limited range of microcatheters uh, and get comfortable using microcatheters, exchanging out what, what's kind of the, you know, so I'm a terrible golfer. So if I go golfing, I need my putter for sure. I probably need a wedge uh, and I need a five iron and anything else is going to get me into trouble. What, uh, what would you take uh, to the golf course in the way of microcatheters? I think that for um, operators who are beginning their experience in complex intervention, in, even independent of CTOs, um, the first steps are familiarity with the uh, the torqueable delivery catheters, um, catheters such as uh, the Corsair catheter, the Turnpike catheter, and um, perhaps the Corsair XS, XS or LP cath the Turnpike LP catheters. In other words, these are the braided torqueable catheters that have a great deal of utility for guidewire exchanges, for um, for 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 uh, for for tortuosity, uh, for calcific disease, independent of CTOs itself. Um, we can certainly talk about crossing collaterals and everything, um, and which type of catheter we would use for epicardial versus septal collaterals. But I think that for just becoming familiar with the very basic um, use of a microcatheter, this is the best place to start. There's one addition I would add to that, and that is the uh, dual lumen catheters too. I think these have understated utility in complex disease, bifurcation disease for obviating um, all the real estate that you need to navigate in the more proximal segment of the vessel to get you to a bifurcation that's the subject of interest, for example. Um, it has utility, of course, in CTOs that we can discuss further. The other categories, the, um, the angled catheters, as Man has described, in, in very unique situations are bailout catheters. They have um, incomparable utility and similarly the penetrating catheters for very calcific disease, non-crossable lesions, um, th those have very specialized uh, purpose and that would be perhaps um, microcatheter 
101 or 201, I guess, after the introductory course with the ones that I've mentioned. Great. Probably time to to dive into some of the engineering here. I'm going to call on uh, Alex and and Josh again to to take us through, uh, you know, what at the engineering level, construction level, what differentiates a conventional sort of uh, tube of a microcatheter versus a contemporary so-called torqueable microcatheter. Can you talk to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think you know much like the like the uh, the reference from Dr. Kanzari about the evolution of of the vehicle and the engine. Um, you know, the, the microcatheter evolution has been it has been similar from from like you say, the basic extrusion with a hub on it um, to mentioned and coil supported structures and then you get to the more um, the more complex construction of the the catheters mentioned by Dr. Kanzari in the uh, the Corsair catheter and the Turnpike line of catheters that are more of a hybrid construction um, that employ you know both that that coil and braid um, in order to achieve sort of a, a blend of the the three most important factors that are really just you know the, the pushability um, the torqueability and then that wire movement support um, piece of, of the of the catheter that really Really allows you to, to advance, um, you know, both both save your progress and advance your progress through the the use of the wire and microcatheter techniques. But I think the biggest thing probably to highlight here is just the way that um, the, the braid and the coil interact, and and from kind of an engineering perspective, what's going on there. So um, the way that the that that these complex microcatheters are constructed is with sort of that um, you know that lubricious inner lumen um, of the of the PTFE liner and then um, a, a braid um, immediately over that. And, uh, and what's important about that braid is really that it provides some um, torqueability and pushability as you know, many uh, people are familiar with and you know, um, guide catheters can both be torqued and pushed and they're just braid supported. They don't have a coil typically. Um, but in, this, in the construction of these complex microcatheters, typically the, the purpose of the braid is more to protect um, the guide wire lumen. And, uh, and, and to understand why is really um, a function of how a coil um, behaves when it when it's torqued. Um, and a good example of that is an, another, you know, another product that we offer the, the guide liner. You wouldn't expect if you twisted a guide liner from one end that you'd really generate much torque on the other end because that's just a coil um, supported um, catheter in isolation. And when you twist one end of a coil, it's kind of like a slinky. It's free to either expand or contract based on uh, the direction you are uh, rotating it with respect to the direction that the coil is wrapped. Um, and so the, the braids function in a in a microcatheter um, like the Corsair or the Turnpike is really to protect that guide wire lumen as you're torquing it that one of those coils doesn't isn't allowed to turn down and impede um, that guide wire lumen um, as you're twisting it in the direction that causes it to contract and then uh, conversely to that you know when you're when you're torquing it in the opposite direction um, that the polymer is there really to bound um, the movement of the coil outward as well. So you get um, some of that torque transmission when the coil is bounded. And then uh, it, just a, a quick note uh, specifically to the Turnpike product, um, this, uh, this unique feature of, you know, the way that coils transmit torque by, you know, either expanding or contracting until they hit a limit of some sort um, is really the, the driving factor behind um, the design of that device using a, a dual layer coil as opposed to a single layer coil. And what happens um, when you torque that, that catheter in the, in the clockwise direction, um, the inner coil is actually expanding out and the outer coil is contracting down. And that's really what what uh, what contributes to the you know the torqueability of that catheter while still allowing it to maintain you know the flexibility that you're looking for to navigate through tortuosity and be able to to, to get it down to the lesions that you're looking to to treat. If you're counterclocking it too, then on the inner coil you'll have contraction. Is that right? Yep, exactly. And th and that is like I mentioned before, that is really the intention of the braid is to in that in that counterclockwise direction, you know, that inner coil is still producing torque as it clamps down on the braid um, that sits to protect that guide wire lumen. And you're getting a little bit of torque transmission from the outer coil as well as it expands into the polymer outside. So Alex, on the other direction, so when you actually clock it, so you're actually getting the, the coils to go outwards. Then the braid doesn't really matter, right? Because the coils are going in the other direction. So, what is the goal of the braid in that scenario? Is it just to protect the lumen, or does it do anything to protect the integrity of the polymer? What is the the goal of the braid in this scenario? 
Yeah, it, it does for sure. Um, certainly, you know, in the counterclockwise direction, its main purpose is to protect the guideware lumen. In the clockwise direction, like you mentioned, there's really no force um, on that. So all that we're all that the braid really is carrying there is that that pushability and a little bit of the torque uh, of the device is generated just by just like a, a normal braid only supported catheter. You know, you do get you do get get some kink resistance. You get a bit of pushability and um, some torque response out of the braid. Obviously, the the majority of the torque response in these hybrid constructed catheters come from the mechanics behind the coil expanding and contracting, uh, as we mentioned, uh, when it's bounded by one or the other. But the braid certainly does help um, with that push and torque to a certain degree as well. So Alex, the man is too, when you, when you, when, and Chris too, when we talk about all this torquing too, it kind of raises the issue of fatigue to me. And um, just for fun, last evening, I did a Google search for, uh, court, for, for micro catheter fatigue and nothing comes up other than advertisements from manufacturers who say how their designs are intended to reduce fatigue, but nobody really talks about what fatigue is. And Manus, I think that at least in my experience, we kind of collectively um, uh, learned about fatigue in our early experience with microcatheters. And then it was more by just best practice sharing and networking and talking about, hey, I was using this microcatheter and I was torquing it and it wasn't advancing further, or I felt like I was spinning it at the at the hub and on the very proximal part, if anything, the, the braid was starting to come apart a little bit or I would, all the movement was at the braid, but there was no one-to-one -one transmission that this was really how we were starting to discover what the term fatigue meant. And all it, and it, what it all ultimately translated to is if, if you, you experience this type of resistance or difficulty or lack of advancement, it's time to change it out and uh, try a different microcatheter, but that it was either related to very excessive tor uh, um, torquing because of complex disease, and then there's some perception that it was maybe related to longer dwell time of the catheter as well. But um, maybe we'll get Alex's thoughts too, but Manus, your, your experience with that too? No, I agree with you, Dave. I mean, it, it's hard to tell when this happens. Did you over torque the catheter or not? Or did you have the, in my mind, there's two categories. One is you over torque, which we've all done. And then you keep on clocking, 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 don't give it enough rest. And then the catheter gets destroyed. Yeah. The other one is when you have the wire there for like two hours and you don't change to change it. And then by the time the whole thing is fused, which I think may have to be a clot or blood coming into the micro catheter. But I would love to hear from Alex as well. What are his thoughts? And I know the coils obviously protect it because they give you more resistance in, in order to prevent the coils from unraveling. But curious if there are any other mechanisms, so to speak, that uh, lead to this fatigue. Yeah, definitely. Um, from from the engineering standpoint, um, if you can imagine sort of the each one of the intersections between the um, the metallic structures and the polymer that that pots it. Um, gives you kind of a, a an interface um, to allow that to sort of start to loosen up over time. So the way that these, because there's so much, you know, there's so much metallic structure in these um, these current generation of microcatheters with the the braid and the coil, and at times there's a dual layer coil. You know, you're looking at upwards of 30 or 40 different individual uh, wire filers that run from the hub to the tip of the catheter, and uh, each one of those um, wires is encased by polymer. Of of course, as you can see in some of the clear catheters, if you look, you know, very closely, you can start to even see some of those um, th those individual wire filers. And what's happening um, when you when you twist the catheter um, and and sort of uh, push it. Uh, in, in that rotational or uh, or sort of compression or extension, um, you, you are loosening the bond to a certain degree between the polymer and each one of those metallic filers. And as you continue to torque, and, and Manos, you uh, you mentioned as well that when you twist, you know you really put a lot of power into it. You're you're stressing the bonds between um, the polymer that is sort of the uh, the resin in the fiberglass matrix, if you will, um, and each one of those intersections that sort of holds that composite matrix together is starting to get a little bit more free play and that's what you start to perceive as you rotate and you start to lose response it's because you're you are absorbing that slop essentially between the the metallic structures of the of the device and the polymer that holds it all together has a little bit of wiggle room and as you continue to work that the wiggle room gets more and more to the point where you start to feel like you're losing response or 
you lose guide wire movement because you're starting to get a little bit of delamination on the guide wire lumen or something like that. So that's really kind of the mechanics behind um, when you're when you're pushing the catheter, um, what's uh, what's happening sort of at the microscopic level. Fantastic. Before we leave microcatheters, I want to just take advantage of some a uh, couple of great videos we we had prepared. Uh, I might get uh, I might get uh, David to to kind of annotate this first uh, couple of videos uh, on the right hand position. You know, you're not going to get microcatheter fatigue if you don't actually torque the microcatheter, and you got to have the right hand position to torque it. David, what? How do you hold a microcatheter, and and how does that translate in, into being able to torque it and rotate it properly? Sure. Um, at least for my technique, um, I I don't. Um, routinely wire, um, navigate wires with a torquer, but I'll put a torquer on the guide wire itself. And then um, with the palm of, and I'm right handed, and with the palm of my right hand, kind of hold the lock torquer kind of as an anchor or base to, to secure the guide wire so that the guide wire is not moving forward or coming back. And then um, with my thumb and um, first two fingers, we'll rotate the microcatheter, typically in a clockwise, but sometimes counterclockwise fashion. And at the same time, I'll have my left hand holding uh, the, 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 the catheter shaft as it enters the TUI of the guiding catheter as well um, in to, for additional rotation, for additional support as well. And as the catheter continues to advance over the guide wire, simply uh, relocate that torquer as a, as a home base anchor for my uh, fourth and fifth fingers and and continue to advance uh, forward. And typically, um, as we're discussing, and depending on the type of catheter and its purpose, whether it's a counter or clockwise fashion, it's really a uh, one to one with looking not at the catheter itself, but looking at the microcatheter on the screen um, for watching advancement of it. And um, when you're meeting resistance and buck or, or buckling or bowing of the catheter, um, knowing when to make appropriate adjustments with, with a guide catheter extension, your guide catheter or other. Beautiful, beautiful description. Uh, Manus, uh, we alluded earlier on about the reluctance of some operators who are not yet experienced with microcatheters to use them. Uh, and one of the one of the factors I think is the need to, you know, the, the, the microcatheters are not the therapy. So at some point you got to take it out and, and deliver your stent, presumably. Uh, tell us about uh, how we remove full length microcatheters on contemporary short wires. Yeah, Chris, that is actually an area that, uh, you know, there are four ways to do it. And in my mind, the best way is the trapping technique, which I think you have a beautiful illustration for which is you get the microcatheter to pull back as much as possible, get a balloon not over the wire, distal to the tip of the microcatheter, inflate the balloon, then pull the microcatheter back. That's, I think, the most secure way to do it. You save yourself from the risk of removing the guide wire, uh, less radiation, because after the initial pull, you don't have to fluoro the wire anymore. And actually, the trap liner can do the same thing, uh, in, as, as we'll discuss, I'm sure, down the line, without uh, having to use an extra balloon by using uh, the trap liner. The other three ways is to put in a wire extension, which works, but the extension is not as secure as the actual wire. The third one is the hydraulic, where you put a, a little syringe or endoflator with cell in, and essentially you apply pressure and uh, you get the wire to essentially the microcath to fly out. Actually, we did this with, uh, with Dave a few days ago on the CTO Connect recording on a CTO, which is not exactly my best way to do it, but in any case. And the fourth one, which happens when you have the fatigue, is to actually do, to cut the microcatheter, that's what we call the circumcision technique, to cut it and actually fill it away little piece by piece until you actually get all the microcatheter out. But I think the trapping is the best way to do it, both for CTOs, for non-CTOs, for any technique, and that's I think what most people should be familiar with. There's beautiful illustrations uh, in your CTO manual as well for that, Manasu, for anyone who wants to uh, to see the figures that uh, that we're showing uh, uh, and and look at them more carefully, it's a very important skill set to have. Let's move on to uh, to guide extensions. Uh, and I'm going to admit here that I was a bit of a dinosaur. I remember when the when the original uh, guide extension, the guide liner, came out, that I viewed it as kind of a crutch for those who didn't know how to use guide catheters properly. Um, and uh, you know, I've had a large slice of humble pie since then. I think I was uh, I was wrong. Um, how important are they day-to-day -day practice for, for regular PCI, David? 
So the, yes, this is um, uh, my humble pie too that I admitted to at the beginning of our program that um, more than 10 years ago, I uh, was thinking about how we would just reserve the use of a guide catheter extension for complex interventions, however we were going to do that uh, or, or what, for what purpose. But um, really now, uh, my colleague um, many years ago at Scripps said that he thought the guide catheter extension was the greatest advancement to interventional cardiology in this decade. And I don't know, maybe it, it, that's certainly a, 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 an easily um, representable um, proposal though, because um, it's such a frequent part of our daily practice now. And I think part of it too is driven by a much higher utilization of radial interventions. And as we perform even more and more complex procedures, just as you introduced earlier, Chris, and then combining that with some unique challenges in guide catheter support that um, the use of the use of a guide catheter extension becomes even more commonplace. You know, when when you, Manus, and I were were in our earlier phases of our careers, and there was such debate about deliverability between the sirolimus eluding stainless steel stent and the paclitaxel eluding stainless steel stent. And back then we didn't have guide catheter extensions, and we were talking about anchor balloons deep seating guide catheters or mother and child techniques with a four French catheter and a six French guiding catheter and stripping off stents and everything and how how different perhaps life would have been if we had the guide catheter extension technology that we have today. Yeah, that that whole conversation sort of boiled down to uh, to nothing once yeah. the guide extension <laughs> yeah. was introduced. Uh, but a lot of wasted time on the podium about it, that's for sure. Uh, I think of, uh, I think of, uh, of operators nowadays as either anticipators or reactors when it comes to guide extension. Uh, th there's those of us who put it, you know, have a low threshold, put it in up front because it can be awkward to add later. Um, and there's those of us who are concerned about the cost and concerned about the complexity and other problems that might come up with an ex a guide extension. And we we wait for the case to prove that we we need it. Which, which camp are you in, David, and, and you, Manus? For myself, I'm a, I'm a, uh, anticipator. I am not a reactor. Um, uh, in, unless there's unless there is something um, specific about a case where I think I'm going to need um, additional equipment in the guiding catheter and space is going to be challenged to accommodate multiple catheters, and we can discuss this further. Um, other than that, if I if I realize it's going to be a more complex case, uh, I'm certainly one to go forward from the beginning with the catheter, and we can and and. You know, it, it, it facilitates also the issues, depending on the guide catheter extension you use, about the trapping issue as well. And Manus, what about you? And, and tell us, if you are, if you're an anticipator like David, tell us what are the key angiographic uh, uh, signals that tell you you're going to need one? Yeah, actually, I am more of a mixed uh, on this one. I, there are some times where I always use it. So examples, undergrade, go, integrate, sexual reentry, you want to minimize hematoma, then I will use it pretty much every case. But other, or for example, the engagement is poor. I know I'm going to have difficulty delivering a front. I do it a front to save uh, uh, the effort required. But quite often, if it's something that seems like it may be doable with standard guide catheters and standard equipment, I will try this first. And if it doesn't work, then I will insert the um, the guide extension as well. The things that make me want to use them up front are again CTO, ADR. Uh, when you have, uh, I found for like an um, anomalous coronary that you have anterior takeoff right or an inferior takeoff for this vein graft that the guide is not sitting quite properly. I think for those, there is no point in waiting until you prove yourself wrong. You don't deliver things. I think it's best to just do it up front and get it done. The one exception is when you have a lot of osteal disease and sometimes you're concerned with dampening and potentially causing ischemia, in which case you may want to engage and disengage the vessel. But otherwise, uh, for those complex cases, I will use it quite often on the upfront basis. You know, we, we hear from from uh, from a variety of, of sources, including up through our sales force, that there are a significant number of interventional cardiologists who are afraid of injuring the coronary when they use a guide extension. Is that is that something that that concerns you? Uh, are there techniques that you employ? when you're advancing guide extension tools specifically to either ease the advancement of them or to reduce the risk to the coronary um, in, when you're doing that. Tell us about that. So I, I absolutely right. I think you can cause a lot of damage with uh, guide extensions, especially if you um, use a distal angle, put the balloon down distally and then just try to jam it in. 
I think that sometimes in the setting of disease might dissect or cause some other issues. The way I like to use them is in most cases with the inch warming technique, small balloon, typically two or 20, halfway in, halfway out, inflate to six or eight, balloon down, advance. Same thing, move the balloon, inflate, deflate, advance it down. I think by doing that, you first of all, I think you center the guide extension so it doesn't go on the wall as much. And then it's really much easier. You literally don't have to push hard. You just advance at the, at the right moment when the balloon is going down, that advance is much nicer. And I, you know, I, it can always happen, we have issues, but in general, after using this technique, it's extremely rare to get a problem with uh, injuring the vessel. I would agree with that too, Manis. And um, I think that you know, we, can, we can traumatize coronary arteries in many ways, other than just a guide catheter extension, of course. But, um, but making sure that there's appropriate coaxial alignment of the guide catheter and the guide catheter extension, I think, minimizes this. I, I, I completely agree with you about the inchworm technique. Um, unless um, there's an anchor technique, as you know well, that you can inflate a balloon distally and just simply advance the catheter down over the shaft of an inflated balloon. And I'll do that only in instances if I know I've pre-dilated adequately the more proximal segment, and I know that I'm going to stent that as well. But I think the other thing, too, is um, just being very cautious and mindful about uh, contrast injections and not inducing a hydraulic dissection when you know that the guide catheter is deep seated in an artery and um, and and there's pressure dampening. Anything you can do to to you know prevent the inadvertent uh, um, creation of hydraulic dissection once you know you're down you've got pressure deep pressure dampening ventricularization you've lost the pressure altogether anything you do that's prophylactic to that David. Um, when I have, uh, other than, you know, simply with uh, it delivering my stent using the guide catheter quickly and, it, and if I'm inducing ischemia too, um, certainly bringing the catheter back and then, and then injecting it. But after I've delivered the balloon or the stent or whatever is delivery is probably my most common method. And the other thing I think we hear bubble up from the front line is the whole concept of wire wrap. And if, it's certainly if it's not something you're anticipating and you suddenly can't, uh, for instance, deliver a stent, um, that can be pretty frustrating to, uh, to uh, a, a novice guide extension user. Anybody want to comment on that? How, what, what is it? How do you prevent it? So actually, I thought I can briefly speak. Actually, I was guilty of this in the early days. I would go and complain like, this doesn't work. The, the stents don't go through. And imagine you spend 20 minutes to get the guide extension down a very complex coronary. And then all of a sudden, the, the stents don't go through the <laughs> through the cylinder. So that can be obviously a very frustrating experience. But in my mind, there are two techniques that every guide extension user should use. One is the inch warming we talked about. The second is to take a towel and put it on the side and put the rod of the guide extension inside the towel. This way, you'll prevent the wrap of the wires. You'll make your life much, much easier. And then uh, the third potential thing if you use, be careful if you use a smaller guide extension than the guide, because sometimes you have an eight friends guide and we'll put a six friends guide extension. And that, you know, can lead to problems. If you don't pay attention, you put wires that go on the side of the guide extension, that can be a problem. But the inch warming, the towel on the side for preventing wrapping, these are two techniques, I think, that will make your life a whole lot easier. Yeah, and just to, just to amplify uh, Manis's comments too, is that is that it's important too when you when you feel like you're encountering wrap um, or, or or resistance I should say in delivering a stent uh, it's important for example especially for the stents just to look under fluoroscopy and see exactly where the interaction is occurring because if it's at the hub at the proximal hub of the guide catheter extension that may be an interaction issue between the two devices and you want to check your stent and make sure that there's not been a lifting of the stent or scaling of the stent but in if it's if it's certainly in the shaft for example as i experienced on just just within the past week that was clearly a wrap issue and balloons were going fine and it was only when i was trying to deliver the stent that it was it was recognized that that was an in instance of wrap I see we've got about 10 minutes left, uh, and I thought maybe I'd bring Josh Bernizer into the uh, discussion, Josh, and I, I, I would like to hear about uh, effective uh, internal diameters, if we could, and, and what are the engineering considerations to spending as little ID as we can when we create uh, a guide extension device? Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's a, uh, that's a great question. And and you know, just for the, the general audience, when we say effective ID, what we really mean by that is what is the smallest point from the moment you enter the hemostasis valve on the proximal end to the moment you exit the, the guide extension at the distal end? And that, that's really 
you know, what is going to be your um, limiting factor in what you can deliver through a guide extension. And, you know, there's a couple of different considerations that you have to, to, to take into account. And, you know, Chris has heard me say this multiple times, but engineering really sometimes is the art of, art of compromise. And so we, you can make something that's, that's much stiffer and, and much more pushable um, by taking up more space, or you can try and find that equilibrium where, where a device has sufficient delivery and you're then maximizing your space. You know, in the case of, of Guideliner, we did, um, we chose to design that with a ribbon um, or a rectangular shaped push wire that then, you know, keeps it, it lays flat in the tangent space of the, the bottom of a guide catheter, if you think of it as a circle, and allows you to have um, an equal effective ID all the way through the guide catheter to the point that you exit the distal tip of the guide catheter or the guide extension catheter. If you, you know, have a larger round push rod, that can sometimes take up additional space. So it's just something to think about and consider as you're deciding what you can fit inside of, of what size guide extension, um, you know, and planning your cases. Uh, take that into consideration and, and really think about that. Right. Now, um, Manus, uh, we're, what, 10, 11 years into the modern era of guide extensions. Have, have there been any important advances in guide extension technology, or are we are we just tweaking? Well, for me, I mean, they're getting obviously more deliverable. I think the polymers have improved. I think the ID has improved. The transition of the uh, rod with the collar has improved. But I think the biggest one in my mind, and actually very useful for complex PCI and CTO PCI, has been adding the trapping balloon. So having this hybrid, you get one device that you can actually use as a trapping balloon, a, a trap liner. I mean, that has been actually tremendous. Um, and uh, it's fascinating because using that, we used to say, if you have a six friend guy, you cannot do undergrade CTO PCI with large microcatheters because it doesn't have enough ID or the stingray balloon. And now actually with um, with trap liner, six friends, you can actually do pretty much everything and use trap pretty much any microcatheter and you can trap your stingray balloon as well. So that truly has, um, I think, improved our ability to treat, especially in cases with poor access and an ability to use a larger guide catheters. Josh, when uh, when you were designing the trap liner, there were a number of uh, additional compromises, sh shall we say, that had to be considered to create a device that was both a guide extension and a trapping device. What you want to take us through? Uh, what what came of those compromises and what we have for a device as a result? Yeah, I, you know, I think the the biggest one I, I hear about is is balloon position. Well, why can't you put the balloon in, at the distal tip of the uh, of the guide extension and make trapping a, a lot easier and more effective? Um, you know, I think the reality of that is, is that we have to have a lumen to inflate or deflate that balloon. And so if we were to put it at the very distal tip of the of the guide extension, it, you would give up a, a pretty significant portion of the idea of that. So really trying to fine tune the length of the distal shaft to, to make it function or usable as a guide extension, but then also getting that balloon as close as we could to the distal tip. And so that was, you know, I think one of the, the bigger, you know, fine tuning points I'll, I'll say of, of the engineering and design of that device was, was really settling on that. And it's, it's, you know, the proximal edge of the balloon is 19 centimeters back from the distal tip of uh, the, the trap liner. The, the other big one, and, and we kind of hit on it uh, a few seconds ago, was just making sure, again, that we had an ID that we could inflate and deflate that balloon. And that really, you know, forced us to choose um, a hypo tube rather than, than a straight ribbon wire for, for the push rod of that device. Uh, it has, the, has a, a little bit of a benefit in that it's a little bit more pushable, um, but you do have to take that into consideration as you're using it in that it is a hypo tube. You have to be you know, cognizant that you're handling a, a balloon catheter on that, that push rod. So be careful in your handling. You know, be careful of, of how you're inserting it into your hemostasis valves and, and points like that. I think those are you know, two of the bigger considerations that we had in the design. Um, and I don't want to take up, take up uh, all of the time that we have remaining talking through each finer detail, but, but more than happy to, uh, to cover that with anybody that, uh, that has questions. Chris, I would also um, say that an understated recognition of the differences between different guide catheter extensions, though, has to do with the ID issues that Josh has raised and compatibility. Um, there, are, there are some guide catheter extensions that permit uh, the use of two different devices of different sizes, and there are others that 
will uh, will be will be six French also, but not permit the same use of those devices. And so it's it's I think it's incumbent on the operator to be familiar with your equipment and know what the tolerances are, um, and that they're not shared across different different brands, different manufacturers' um, products. Um, uh, you know, a, a flat ribbon versus a, a round wire. Uh, uh, is is very different with regard to compatibility, and then um, and then having a hypo tube as uh, you described, Josh too. Great points, Manus. Anything to add to that? You yeah, absolutely, and I think part of it has to do with um, your familiarity with the device, right? The first time you use it, you always get okay. What is this? What is the color? How do I do it? For me, the the one thing we didn't mention so far that I think is very useful is when you try to put wires through the guide extension. Um, I have our fellows who routinely destroy wires because they push them, they jump them in, don't pay attention, and then they get caught sometimes on the transition. So be aware that, I think Dave mentioned this before, if you have any resistance, resistance is usually going to be at the transition point, and you're just going to look under fluoro, and then if you redirect, it goes very well, you don't destroy your wire. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, um, Chris, I learned from you, and I haven't experienced this yet, and Manus, maybe you, you learned this um, just by chance too, but with uh, specifically the trap liner catheter, it seems that if you're needing to advance a second wire, you can actually advance the micro catheter right to the hub and then the wire will go straight through without a lot of difficulty, which is which is something I'm excited to, to apply in practice. Look forward to hearing back, uh, see if you were successful with that as well, David, because yeah. Uh, yeah, you take equipment to the limits all the time. So if, you, if, if it works for you, then it works. Well, this has been a fantastic uh, hour. The time has flown by from my standpoint. Um, I guess we're in the wrap-up mode now. And uh, the first thing I want to say is, of course, thanks to to all four participants, uh, our engineers, as well as uh, uh, Dave Kanzari and, and Manus Berlakis. It's been ter terrific. And uh, I always learn something. I keep learning. And uh, there's at least uh, half a dozen things that, uh, that you've made me think about uh, today. So thank you for that. Uh, I wonder if you, if either of you have any final uh, reflections. Uh, we've been talking kind of like microcatheters and guide extensions are, you know, two separate things, uh, never the twain shall meet. But, but maybe there's a reflection about the combination of those tools with the best contemporary guide wires and, and what that combination provides uh, the contemporary operator who, who endorses and, and embraces the technologies. David, first. Um, well, again, thank you for having me as part of this program and to the engineers from whom I've learned a lot, as well as from you and Manus. And I would um, just summarize by saying once again that um, whereas it, it, we've seemingly plateaued in a success rate for CTO revascularization, it's first of all not all about just the success rate alone. It's about the safety of the procedure. It's about the timeliness and, and the success of doing it versus spending six hours in a procedure and being successful versus 90 minutes in a procedure and being successful. And the other part is that uh, is very much these are enabling technologies. And they're enabling not just for chronic total occlusions, which is the spirit of our CTO summit, but it's also an effort to standardize practice across a broader range of operators. That um, these techniques that um, Manus, you know, along with many of it, have introduced as the hybrid algorithm or, or other algorithms and strategies, these are not. Uh, to be considered esoteric. It's how do we you know, make these more commonplace across cath labs in the United States and abroad. And, um, and we do this through uh, the advancement of technologies, the refinement of technologies that uh, are the enablers like microcatheters and guide catheter extensions. Well said, David. Manus, you have the honor of the last word in 30 seconds. The pressure is on, but no, I want to again echo what David was saying. My practical advice for people is that there is no such thing as complex PCI or not. If you're doing PCI, these tools you should know. I think if you get mislabeled as a complex PCI tools, then people who would benefit from them and do things more safely, more efficiently, and in a better way would not get the benefit of doing them. So I would encourage everyone to try if you're not trying them already and have a card where your equipment is there, your guide extensions, your microcatheters, your equipment for managing complications. So if you need them for a complex case, it's all available for use at an instant. Again, thanks again, Chris, and thanks uh, Alex and Josh and Dave. That was a phenomenal evening. Thank thanks you. everyone. It's a, it was an honor to have you all on and I hope the audience has enjoyed it as much as, uh, as I have. Good day.